This is Senate Appropriations, and this afternoon we're taking testimony from uh, Chris Roop, Joint Fiscal Office, um, regarding the uh, pension um, agreement that has been reached. Obviously, um, that um, area of underfunding um, has been a topic of, of great concern. We had a, a task force created and um, in the last couple of weeks have come to an agreement with the two unions, VSEA and the NEA. And so I thought it would be helpful if uh, Chris gave us a run through um, of that agreement because it does have uh, fiscal implications. And um, I just wanna start by saying um, at in December, Senator White um, came to me and said, you know, in order to make anything work, we need to understand uh, the money side of it so that we understand the budgetary um, possibilities and limitations. And so um, starting in the beginning of December, um, I was participating with the uh, um, union um, members and uh, working with joint fiscal staff in terms of how we could address the um, the request that the unions had of the state, um, because the state was asking the unions to uh, underwrite um, a bit more of the cost of the benefit. And, um, and they obviously were very concerned um, about um, what the state would do in return. So there are a couple of things that came down and I'll just reference them because they tie back into money and then Chris can get into the details. One was they wanted the ADEC, uh, which is the annual uh, uh, contribution, which has two parts. One is the normal cost of retirement, um, and the other was the payment made on the um, amortized unfunded liability. Um, and they wanted to have um, assurances that the ADEC would be paid and that there would be what they called a plus. In other words, an additional payment that would be used to uh, on a, a predictable annual basis, um, buy down or reduce the underfunded liability. So in the end, we were able to come up with money that was freed up because of higher contributions um, and having to add a bit more money to deal with two things, one of which was uh, the pension system and the other was uh, on the healthcare benefit. And I just want to refresh people's memory that we have, um, and uh, maybe you don't need to have your memory refreshed, but last year, remember this, we, we voted and the Senate voted unanimously to start paying pre-funding our uh, teachers' um, health care benefit. And in the end, we couldn't come to agreement because of time with the House. And so we ended up compromising and uh, putting that 13.8 or 9 million in reserve in the Ed Fund. And then we also had um, in the uh, language so that at the end of the year, um, half of any surplus would go to state employees um, uh, prepaying health care. And in addition, we had 150 million in reserve pending release upon agreement um, of, this, uh, of this pension package. So um, sometimes it's hard to reconstruct where we put money and the purpose, but um, so we had, we had um, 52.4 million was the 50% uh, of the surplus last year that was um, identified to go for state employees prepay. We had the 13.8 or nine in the Ed Fund that was reserved to deal with teachers normal um, health care benefit or prepay. And then we had the 150 one-time money uh, to go toward um, pension under funding. So, um, and then the unions and the membership were very concerned about how to get this uh, underfunding uh, down. And the other thing that I think took um, um, many people by surprise, or really we had not put it all in one place. And that was the fact that for the state employees, the underfunding of their healthcare benefit was greater than the underfunding of their pension benefit. So um, this gave us a wonderful opportunity to put together a package where we dealt with the, um, the two 
components of economic security for our retired teachers and our retired state employees. And that was deal with the underfunding of healthcare by getting into that pre-funded um, arrangement where we had an identifiable, predictable commitment to make a contribution every year. Right now we've got PAYGO and that's most expensive because it's all dollar for dollar. There's no investment, there's no compounding, there's no capital gains, there's just nothing. And so um, I think from my perspective, we ended up um, in a very good place in terms of getting both of those benefits um, taken care of for currently employed um, teachers and currently employed state employees. Um, the general fund is still uh, on the hook for the past underfunding. Um, that's, I wanna be clear, none of that is being shifted to the education fund. That was obviously a concern, um, but uh, by um, this package in, a, in total, means that we're reducing our uh, underfunded liabilities on the state ledger by over $2 billion. So it is a very, very um, significant reduction in um, those liabilities that the state has to reflect for um, transparency and uh, accounting purposes. Um, so the governor and along the same lines has in his budget is proposing buying down some of the general obligation bonds and free, freeing up money to be used in other places. Very same kind of concept because by doing a one-time benefit, and Chris will correct me if I'm wrong, if we did a $200 million um, one-time payment toward underfunding, two years out, the amortized liability payment would be reduced by $19 million. So there's a very good benefit from flowing from those one-time uh, payments. And once you free up that 19 million, then it gives you the, the savings then can be applied and be used to fund the plus on the ADEC, which is what they asked. So it's when the conversation is, it's all interwoven, it's all interwoven. And that's why it has to be, um, I wanna just restate, it's really looking at everything as a package. Um, so. Um, with that, refreshing people's memories of what we had parked in various places in anticipation or to give us some resources to, um, uh, to work within coming up with an agreement. We had those three, um, and it does mean that we're going to have to put a bit more money because it's been an unaddressed um, cost, and that's pre-funding health care for state employees. Um, and that will take a bit more general fund net. And just the same is true on the ed fund. It will take money on an ongoing basis to pre-fund um, the, uh, the healthcare benefit for currently employed teachers. Um, and we also um, recognizing the higher, um, significantly higher level of underfunding of teachers um, made, we're proposing in the agreement to um, take the 150, split it equally, but then um, uh, apply another one-time payment of $50 million toward the teachers under funding. And so we're going to have to find that, that we'll have to find um, that additional um, uh, money for that $50 million underfunding. So I'm just kind of laying that out in terms of what this committee is going to have to be thinking about um, as it relates to uh, the money and um, how we're uh, funding this package. So Chris, I'm going to let you take it from there. Um, it was, um, Chris has had the benefit of working with the task force all um, summer. And, um, and so he's got <laughs> many, many hours of work and looking at, um, you know, what um, different options and what, what would be the financial impact. And um, I think we ended up in a, in a good place to have agreement. And um, I think um, to be able to address um, and put our fiscal house in order is um, some, we're leaving whoever takes our place a few years from now in a better place than you know, we've been in the last few years. So I wanna um, just thank Chris for all his work. And Stephanie, um, in terms of taking my, 
thoughts about how you move money. And if you do this and if you, get, if you gain it here, it's sort of like what I lose here, I can move over here and um, to put together a fiscal summary for, for, both, um, for both groups of employees. And then um, Graham Campbell also helped with, um, particularly with the ed fund on the education side. So the uh, uh, amount of time and the talent joint fiscal provided to, to getting us to this point was really substantial. Um, so with that, Chris, um, why don't you take it from there? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Chris Roop, Joint Fiscal. I have a few slides that if it's okay with you, I'd like to share and just walk through and, and put some numbers to some bullet points to give you a high level overview of uh, what's in the recommendation. So hopefully everybody can see my slide here. Um, you know, let's just, uh, as a quick refresher, when you all passed Act 75 last uh, year, you created a 13 member task force to, to look at uh, pensions and OPEB. And one of the many uh, charges given to this task force was to find ways or, or make recommendations to lower the amount of the uh, ADAC payment and the unfunded liability growth from between 25 and 100% of that giant year over year um, increase we saw from FY21 to FY22. So translating those words into numbers gives you those summaries on the right there of what that 25 and 100 uh, translates to. Um, both uh, recommendations for the systems do get you into that territory of reducing the liabilities uh, by, by that amount. Um, one thing that's really important to note here that, that Senator Kitchell uh, touched on was uh, this, uh, this report and the recommendations were the product of negotiations that went through the holiday season and really right up through last Monday's task force meeting when we adopted the, um, the, the, the wordsmithing of the final report. So immediately once that report was agreed to, we then pivoted to putting some preliminary fiscal analysis together. So that's why you see the numbers in a companion document rather than in the report itself was because of the, the unfortunate time constraints in the process. But the recommendations for both the, the state and the teacher uh, pension systems really do um, mirror each other in a lot of ways and hit on a few key themes. Um, they all involve um, recommended employee contribution increases on active members that are phased in over a period of time, some relatively modest changes to the benefit structure, commitments of additional state funding to pay down the liabilities, which is what Senator Kitchell was uh, referring to earlier, and pre-funding the OPEB. The OPEB is that subsidized retiree health care benefit. So most of the savings that would come from the pension recommendations are effectively being reinvested into accelerating the, the state's payment toward paying down its unfunded pension liabilities and pre-funding the OPEB. And combined, these recommendations would um, reduce the state's long-term liabilities on the balance sheet by roughly, by roughly $2 billion. For a state the size of Vermont, that is tremendous. And, and one thing I wanna to point out before moving on here is that the employee groups themselves put forth the recommendations that were, that were included in this report. And uh, the recommendations were all agreed to unanimously by everybody on the task force. So um, I think that was a pretty notable thing to, to mention that this was not something that legislators were, were telling people uh, what to do. These recommendations really were put forth by the, the employee groups representatives on that task force. And they're based on things that those members wanted to study during the process. So real quick, I'll run through a few slides for the state employees and then the teachers and then leave a little bit of time for questions. But uh, a few key themes here that are worth uh, mentioning is that uh, the state employees, none of these recommendations involve making any changes to people who are currently retired or terminated vested members. Um, the uh, the uh, recommendations really focus on um, phasing in some higher employee contribution rates on active members over a period of time. So, you know, the theory would go that as your contractual wage increase goes up by some percentage a year, your pre-tax pension contribution would also go up by a smaller amount. So a member would still be taking home more in their paycheck, um, even though their employee contribution 
went up over a phased period of time. There's some relatively modest changes to the COLA, the cost of living adjustment. Uh, that $150 million that you all put in reserve in the end of FY21, um, the recommendation uh, calls for taking 75 million of that 150 and putting it into the state system. The other, you'll, we'll go into this further in another slide, but the other 75, the other half of that 150 would go into the teacher pension system, plus an additional $50 million that would be reserved in FY22. So that's how you get a total of 200 million. There's that 150 reserved in FY21, plus a new 50 to be reserved in FY22. Uh, this, it, the recommendations call for the state committing to a, a plus payment on the ADAC toward the unfunded liability in both systems. So that would begin in FY24, ramp up to a maximum of $15 million in FY26. And that would stay in place until the um, pension systems reach 90% funded. Pre-funding the OPEB benefits is a huge part of the recommendations in both systems. And one piece that's a little unique to the state employees is there was a, there's language um, put forth that you will see in the Budget Adjustment Act when it comes over from the other body, directing the treasurer and the board, the retirement board of trustees to develop some recommendations to create what we call a group G benefit, which would be a new employee group for the Department of Correction staff that would look a little more like the current group C benefit for law enforcement where um, this, this was an issue that first came up several years ago in the law enforcement uh, retirement study group to, um, there was a lot of interest in creating a benefit uh, that's specific to DOC staff, uh, provided that it's done on an actuarially neutral basis to the pension fund and doesn't result in extra costs to the employer. The task force ran some preliminary analysis around what would it take to give everybody uh, the benefit that looks like the existing group C. And they came back with a number that would be unaffordable to, to most members. It would be a, a required contribution rate in excess of 30% of pay. So where the, the group landed was um, creating some language into statute. It, it would be in the BAA because that is going to move quicker. That gives um, folks a little bit more time to sharpen their pencil and, and see and cost out a couple different options and see if they can come up with a acceptable um, recommendation on creating this benefit. And if they can do so by April 15th, that allows time to drop that recommendation into the pension bill. Similar language um, directs the treasurer and the board of trustees to work around this idea of, are there longevity incentives that can be provided that would encourage a group F member who's eligible to retire to keep working past the point at which they're eligible to retire? So again, this is something that very worthy idea, but it needs some further study and some more time than the task force process allowed. So the language was, we, we would give everybody to April 15th to provide some recommendations. That way you all still have a little bit of time to review that and act on it, should you so desire. Slide four um, starts getting into, um, you'll see a few slides here that show the preliminary um, fiscal impacts and, and preliminary is the word on all of these around some of these changes. So the, the state employee pension uh, system recommended beginning in FY23, phasing in higher contribution rates on all active members. This looks a little different for each group. Group C is the law enforcement group. That's about 450 active members. They, they, had a, they had a representative on the task force from the Vermont Troopers Association, and they put forth a recommendation to phase in over a three-year period, half a percent contribution increases. That would yield, uh, beginning in the first year, roughly 200,000 of additional revenue, ramping up to 600,000 by, by sort of full phase in by uh, FY25. Group D is the judges. That's around 50 active members. And group F is by far the largest share. That's you know well over 7,000 members, and that's pretty much all the active employees that aren't in either the law enforcement group or the judges. They uh, put forth a proposal of sort of tiered increases um, based on salary percentiles, where um, the higher one earns, um, the, the more years of a phased-in contribution rate um, would take effect. So uh, folks who are at the lower end of the pay scale would not see an impact, but folks at the higher end of the pay scale would see a higher impact. Uh, there's some details that need to be worked out around, okay, how do we, how do we implement this, this framework? But 
the rough estimates that we received from, from this type of uh, modeling that we asked the actuaries to do was that in year one, this would yield about two and a half million of extra revenue. And by full phase in by year five, which would be FY27, that'd be about 13.3 million. Something really important with all this uh, conversation when we talk about higher employee contributions is that this money that would be generated offsets the normal cost. So uh, the state would effectively save the amount of money that would be generated from the higher rates because the, the employees would effectively be paying a greater share of the normal cost that would otherwise fall to the state to pay through the ADAC. Slide five just shows you a little bit about the um, COLA uh, changes. You'll see these similarly modeled for the teachers as well. The, the recommendation is for group C and group F, change the current minimum and maximums in the, the COLA formula, which currently has a 1% minimum and a 5% maximum to a 0% minimum and a 4% maximum. The other um, key recommendation would be for group C and group F. Currently, in order to receive your first COLA, you need to have received a retirement benefit for at least 12 months. So you need to be retired for at least 12 months. The recommendation is to increase that requirement to 24 months. So basically just delay the, the, rece the receipt of the first COLA for an additional year. An important thing uh, to note is that the recommendation proposes to exempt active employees who are eligible for normal unreduced retirement as of July 1st from these COLA changes um, in an effort to not encourage somebody who can retire to retire. Um, you know, you result, you, you typically see actuarial gains if somebody be, continues to work to a later age than they otherwise can, can leave at for at, at full pension. Group C, the law enforcement had a few other uh, recommendations that were specific to that group. And, and both of these are related. Um, one was to increase the mandatory retirement age from 55 to 57, which um, dovetails with the recommendation from the law enforcement uh, study group from a few years ago. This, I wanna be very clear, would not require anybody to work to age 55 or to age 57. Um, currently, a group C member is eligible for unreduced early retirement at age 50, as long as they have at least 20 years of service. And almost everybody retires at age 50 um, under that provision. So um, one of these, uh, so this would not require anybody to work later than age 50, but in combination with the second bullet point here, where it would allow the maximum benefit cap to go up by one and a half percent for each year you work beyond those benchmarks would allow a member to voluntarily work into their 50s and still see their retirement benefit increase a little bit as a result of that extra year of service and not just from the salary growth they would have received from that, um, from that extra year. How much this will save money depends on how behavior changes, but the actuaries did do some costing out for us and they do expect this will result in some savings because they really don't expect anybody to retire, to, to continue working past age 50 and 20 years of service as it is. So the more you can get behavior to, to voluntarily do that, the more likely you are to see gains. Group D hey, is the Chris, judge. Yes, sir. Chris, I'm wondering, um, the 1.5%, how much is the COLA uh, on an average year for that particular group C? So that's, that's, an, that's an excellent question. Um, group C has a long-term COLA assumption of 2.4%, um, but the COLA varies um, based on that assumption and it has varied right now. So um, up until the last year or so, Inflation has been lower than we've assumed, and this has been an area where we've actually seen some modest savings, and that stopped this year. Um, the CPI has been so high that even though that long-term COLA assumption is 2.4% a year, people in their, in their calendar year 22, COLAs are now getting 4.6. So um, a combination of reducing that maximum from five to four We'll save a little bit of uh, money on the COLA moving forward and reduce some risk from high inflation. But the reason why 1.5 was picked for the max benefit increase 
is it's less than the status quo. So right now, if you're a, a Group C member, every year you work is worth 2.5% of your average final compensation, up to a maximum of 50% of your average final compensation. So if you've got 20 years of service and each year is worth 2.5%, you hit your 50% of max benefit cap at 20 years of service. So anything you work after that, your pension benefit doesn't go up as a result of the extra year you worked. It only goes up as a result of however much your salary may have increased in those extra years. So this is a way of allowing that benefit to increase, but at a lower rate in recognition and sort of in exchange, if you will, for somebody work voluntarily working a little bit longer. Yep. Thanks. Sure. Last, last thing on this slide is I want to mention with Group D, the judges, I, I really want to recognize and, and thank Judge Grierson, um, where because the judiciary did come to the table and participate in this process, even though they have a very small group. And they, they had their own internal stakeholder engagement process and came up with some recommendations that are not going to result in massive savings because the group is so small, but make some very important changes for equity reasons that bring that Group D benefit a little bit more in line with the benefits that other employee groups are receiving. So Group D is different in a lot of ways. Uh, people tend to enter the workforce at a lot later of an age, leave at a later age. The, the normal cost is much higher and uh, the terms of the benefit are just different. But what they've, what they've put forth as a recommendation is with, with the sort of carve outs you see here on this slide, to amend their final um, salary calculation where right now their benefit is based on their, their year of final salary before they retire. And the recommendation is to move to an average of your two final years. So that would look more like the group C law enforcement benefit. Also um, reducing the maximum benefit from the current 100% of final salary to 80% of the AFC. Hardly anybody gets 100% of final salary because you would need 30 years of service in order to get that in Group D. And as I mentioned, people tend to enter Group D at a much later age, so they tend not to accrue 30 years of service the way we would think of a rank and file state employee accruing 30 years. But again, this is an important uh, uh, motion toward equity and bringing that benefit more in line with some of the other groups. For new judges entering the system after July, um, they've recommended raising the retirement age from 62 to 65 putting some further caps on the COLA where it would only apply at the current 100% of CPI rate on the first $75,000 of retirement benefit, which is pretty much the average of, of the Group D uh, retirement benefits. And then a reduced COLA that's calculated at 50% of the CPI on benefit amounts above 75,000. And again, they recommended mirroring the recommendation of the other groups where uh, you would require somebody to be retired for at least 24 months before they get their first COLA. <coughs> Slide six um, just shows you um, what all the, the preliminary fiscal estimates of what these COLA changes are likely to yield. So um, when you add up down the ADAT column, that shows you the, the preliminary estimate of how much these uh, changes would save the um, employer's pension costs. So you could view these in a way as additive to what we saw about the employee contribution increases on an earlier slide. So those Group C COLA changes, if you read down in combination, would save approximately 3.3 million. The Group F changes uh, would save approximately 5.4 million. You know, add them all up, you're looking at roughly 8.8 .8 million of ADAC savings just from the changes to the COLA. That would include, uh, and on top of that, a $58 million reduction of the, the state's pension unfunded liabilities. Slide seven um, pivots over in the uh, recommendations for increased employer commitments to the pension system. So as Senator Kitchell mentioned earlier, 50% um, uh, of that 150 million you all reserved in FY21 uh, would go in and that would um, obviously reduce the unfunded liability by $75 million, um, but it would also, on a, on a two-year lag, assuming the money is paid in FY22, would lower your amortization payments in the future, beginning in FY24. So it's about a 9.4 or 9.5% of the amount of your one-time money 
will be the savings you see on a two-year lag. So you so put that Chris, seven, yes. Um, Chris, um, knowing that um, getting that uh, payment made as soon as possible in order to gener uh, experience the benefit two years out, um, it seems like that would have to be made when? Is that something that has to be done as long as it's made before the end of this fiscal year or, um, or, or does it have to be um, earlier than that? That's a great question. I would say as long as it hits in this fiscal year, um, you will see the savings in FY24. Um, th there's obviously a lag between when, when you all decide to make an appropriation and when the funds are actually invested in VPIC. But the important thing is to take that money and make sure it's reflected in the valuation for FY22, because they'll take the impact of that money. They'll also look at all the other gains and losses the system experienced in FY22, and then recalculate what your FY24 payment will be. Well, so, the reason I asked is because we, we're going to have to um, add to the one time 50 million. And I, I was just wondering, well, uh, obviously, we've got a bill that's coming out of Senate GovOps. We've got the budget adjustment, and then we've got the budget. So I, I'm just trying to uh, think through what would be, um, and I'm sure we'll talk to Stephanie, is that something that we really should move forward on and um, release the money um, as part of the budget adjustment. But that's a, that's a timing issue. So um, I, I'll, we'll have to have further discussion because we do really wanna get that payment made so that we experience that um, those savings in, in that uh, in two years hence. Yep, absolutely. And I think as long as that the, the systems recognize that money by June 30th, you'll, you'll have that savings show up in FY24. Well, if we did in the big bill um, and we've got time, we can make that effective upon passage so that right. it gets, uh, or we can, uh, I, well, we'll have to uh, think that through um, in terms of, of the mechanics of making that work um, within our, uh, within, within the time frame that um, this requires. Okay. Absolutely. I just want to put that out there, and Stephanie, and you can let let us know um, what's the most desirable approach. Absolutely. Um, two other points I want to just highlight before I move on is, you know, Senator Kitchell mentioned the, the ADEC Plus payment, so that's sort of the commitment that once we start seeing the, the savings of that one-time money and the changes really materialize in, in the budget, that a portion of that is reinvested in, in further paying down our, our liabilities. So, we have not had an opportunity to actuarially cost this out yet, but just like with the one-time money, the more you put in above the actuarially recommended amount, you will see savings in future actuarially recommended amounts, and you will save interest costs long-term and accelerate the pay down of those long-term liabilities. And one other key element of the recommendations you see in both the state system and the teacher system is reconfiguring the existing general fund year-end construct. So right now the statute stipulates that 50% of the unallocated unreserved general fund surplus goes into the state OPEB trust. That construct resulted in $52.4 million going into the state OPEB trust at the end of last fiscal year, which is more than enough to begin pre-funding that system. But the recommendation going forward is that you take that 50% construct and instead split it equally. So 25% goes into each of the different pension systems. So again, it continues to accelerate the progress at paying down those long-term retirement liabilities, which will save money in the future. Slide eight um, walks through the OPEB proposal a little bit. And uh, you already heard me mention about the 52.4, but um, a key element to begin pre-funding is that the state will have to enact a pre-funding commitment into um, statute. Um, you already have something like this with the pensions where you basically say, you know, the, the unfunded liability and the normal costs are calculated using this actuarial method. The payments are structured to grow in this way and your unfunded liability needs to be retired by, you know, a certain time period. And you also need to uh, commit to making a payment above the current paygo amount as part of that. So in the near term, pre-funding 
requires a higher expenditure level than PAYGO does, but in the long term, it is tremendously more efficient for taxpayers because you can use investment returns over time to pay these future benefits instead of just paying it out of tax dollars on an ongoing basis. But um, you, know, you don't need to get to 100% funding in order to see the big benefits from pre-funding OPEB. You really need to just do those few things. You need to enact that commitment, that statutory policy, that pre-funding policy, and you need to make that commitment of, and stick with it of making those required payments. And then you get a tremendous savings on your bottom line, which I'll get into on another slide. But it all goes down to how the math works. You can use a 7% discount rate to discount your liabilities if you're pre-funding, as opposed to using a 2.2% discount rate under PAYGO. I see Senator yes. Sears has his hand raised. Yeah, yes. I just, there's, yes, obviously Senator Sears. No, there's obviously nothing here that would require a future legislature to not make the same mistakes that were made in the past and in tough budget times, et cetera. Um, but if there's no surplus, then there's nothing going in. Is that, I'm trying to understand that. No, that's that, true. That, that, uh, that's that would correct. be true. That would be true. So if there's no surplus, then we could find ourselves back in the same boat. Well, so, the, surp the division of the surplus um, is on top of the ongoing commitment for the ADEC plus. With, so it's in addition to the plus payment. I um, see. Okay. So um, I need, that's really important, Senator Sears, to make it clear. The plus is, a, is an ongoing obligation to pay the full ADEC plus $15 million once we ratchet it up and keep it there until the fund is 90%. Then if we have surpluses right now, we do 50% um, to the rainy day fund and 50% um, to retire uh, for uh, state employees OPEB. Um, because we're pre-funding uh, OPEB now, that construct uh, is not relevant. So um, instead what we're saying is the 50% that we had allocated for uh, OPEB would then be replaced with the same 50%, but it would be split half and half between the two pension funds. So, um, and the other half is rainy day, which right now is fully funded. Um, and so you're absolutely right. A lot of that is contingent on what is left at the end of the fiscal year, um, but that would be um, on top of the plus. So, um, that um, that's really important. In other words, the um, the plus is uh, ongoing, and the other part is language um, that would go in uh, the uh, green book, um, stating the legislative intent around fully funding, um, you know, the the benefit and pre-funding healthcare. So, um, I I I realize that what people do in the future, but if anybody's around who's been through what we've been through and trying to figure this out, um, I would hope that they wouldn't go down that path again because the obligation does not go away <laughs> and it comes back. Understood. And, I, I understood. Um, yeah. But I, I, a part of the reason for the sins of the past, if you were, were um, overly... Uh, positive expectations of income from the investments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that and we don't, I don't think we changed that. Well, we actually did lower it um, and it's seven. No, no, I mean, but in the, but in terms of if a new, if a, if the current group or a new group forecasts certain returns and those returns don't happen, you're st that's still a loss. You know, you're expecting certain incre increases. Mm -hmm. And, you know, during inflation, you should be getting a larger amount. But if, mm -hmm. if we go into a deflationary period, we'd get less income. But that depends on the projection of the action. And they're not always right. No, um, Senator Sears had an opinion about um, how far off we were, particularly for teachers. Um, 
And, and that was hard to understand because I think it was over 40% of that underfunding was um, driven by the demographics of teachers, which um, seems like that wouldn't have changed that dramatically. Um, but you're absolutely right. The advantage of course is that um, the uh, investment return is 7%. In some years it'll be much higher and some years it could be lower. Yeah. Um, it's just uh, over a period of time how it smooths out. But uh, Chris, I, I think at one point where we're talking about, or Stephanie, were we up around 9% estimated? It was very high. It was, it was artificially high. And of course, what that does is um, lower the ADEC, but it's only, I mean, all you're doing is deliberately building a future obligation or under, you know, under funding. So uh, um, according to Chris and with our, my conversation with him, the 7% seems to be uh, the, pretty much the norm with across the country for investment returns for pensions. But maybe you can speak to that, Chris. That's, that, that's absolutely right. Um, you know, 7% is our current assumed rate of return. And that is in line with the median of most major American pension systems surveyed by NASRA. Um, we, were, we were much higher um, earlier in the amortization period, like up back near the Great Recession. Uh, the rate was, I think, eight and a quarter. Um, and a lot of systems were up around nine in you know the 80s and 90s. But think about what you were getting on your savings account back in the 80s and 90s. You know, interest rates were so much higher back then. And uh, you know, it, it was a lot easier to get double digit returns consistently in that monetary environment. So that rate of return really has gone down over time due to changing expectations about how markets are gonna perform in the future. And things like knowing what interest rates are and, and inflation are, are factors that um, the actuaries and the investment consultants look at when they're trying to figure out what the amount of money should be. But you know, investment <clears throat> experience is uh, is one factor. Longevity is another factor. Salary growth, um, your retirement behavior, all of these are are factors of the of the plan. Experience factors that can deviate from your assumptions. So there's always inherent risk here, but. Um, having really good, realistic, small C conservative assumptions helps mitigate that risk in the long term. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on slide nine because I already went through it on a previous slide. This just gives you a sense of that, that language around by April 15th, um, there, there's going to be some, 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 some ideas put forth to you all to consider on longevity incentives and, and a, a new group G benefit that, that hopefully can be considered in time to, to potentially be included in the broader pension bill. Here's some slide 10 as some very, very preliminary cost estimates. And I wanna focus on the box on the right that shows you what the impact of, to the unfunded liability is from all of this. So the pension benefit recommendations, that's the changes to the COLA and things like that. Um, you're looking at roughly a $58 million reduction in the unfunded liabilities on that piece. The one-time pension contribution from the state another 75 million. Pre-funding OPEB, you can see what a tremendous bang for the buck that has. $891 million reduction in our long-term liabilities because we can discount our liabilities using a 7% rate if we're pre-funding. And under PAYGO, the accounting rules force us to use a 2.2%. <laughs> but there, these numbers are, are very preliminary and we're working with the treasurer and the actuaries to see um, how these numbers shake out um, because some of the things that were included in the in the final proposal um, were not exactly costed out before um, in the way that they were ultimately recommended finally. And there's going to be timing issues and things like that that can vary the amounts and, and the year at which certain things are recognized. But these are just some very, very preliminary estimates that are going to be refined in the weeks ahead. So it might be a good time to pivot over to a few slides on the teachers. This, these changes are much more straightforward and less complicated because all the actives in the, in the teacher pensions are in the same employee group. So it's not, it's not a situation where we have to create different recommendations for three different employee groups. Just like with the state, no recommended, recommended changes to currently retired or terminated vested members. Similar uh, themes around higher phased in employee contribution rates on actives on sort of a, a progressive structure, some modest changes to the cost of living adjustments, 
the state making a $125 million one-time payment, um, at the same ADEC plus uh, type of commitment and pre-funding OPEB, but in a, a similar way, but with some, some extra sort of nuance around this where the recommendation is to pre-fund the OPEB the way we currently fund the pensions, where the normal cost, it, which is a cost of providing a future benefit to today's workforce is paid out of the ED fund and the amortization and, and sort of pay-go costs for, for today's retirees would live in the general fund. So the teacher proposed contribution rates would be on a, a marginal basis that kind of looks like an income tax where right now most teachers are paying <clears> about <throat> five or 6% regard, regarding, a, a, depending on what date of hire that they had. And the proposal is to beginning in FY23 over a three year period, phase in a marginal structure the way we do with, with our income taxes. So these would be the marginal rates. These would not be the effective rates, but every year, um, it, it would be envisioned that you go through a calculation process and you figure out what everybody's base salary is for the upcoming fiscal year. What your base salary is, you would then calculate the effective rate to charge and then charge that effective rate on every dollar that person earns that year. So just like with the, the state system, higher employee contributions offset <laughs> employer pension costs through the ADAC. Only here, that savings mostly shows up in the ed fund because that's where we pay most of the normal cost out of. So um, beginning in FY23, this would likely yield about 6.2 million of additional revenue. By FY25, when things are fully phased in, we're looking at just over $10 million of additional revenue from these higher employee contributions. Again, this would offset pension expenses that would otherwise fall to the ed fund. Coal exchanges, very similar themes here where um, reducing the current 1% minimum, 5% maximum to a 0% minimum and 4% maximum. Delaying the, the COLA from a minimum of 12 months of retirement to 24 months and exempting um, actives who are eligible for normal unreduced retirement as of July 1st from those changes. Something really important to, to know about the teacher system is that the COLA is calculated differently than it is for the state system. The state system has what we call a full COLA, where your COLA is calculated at 100% of the CPI within those minimums and maximums. The teachers have a COLA that is calculated at 50% of the CPI. So this means that you don't get as much savings on the state side from changing the COLA as you, or on the teacher side, as you do on the state side. There, there's less juice in the fruit to squeeze out of it because it's a less, it's an inherently less uh, generous benefit under status quo. But making these changes will still yield about four and a eight, four and a eight million dollars of ADAC savings total, which includes $1.6 million of additional ed fund savings through the normal cost and some additional uh, roughly 35 million reduction on the unfunded liability. Something that is very key in this uh, proposal is that once the system is in a better shape, 80% funded, there is a provision here that uh, would revisit that 50% of CPI calculation and allow it to be escalated by 7.5% a year. So long as doing so does not cause the pension system to drop back below 80% funded. So what this essentially does is create a path where once the pension system is in a much better state, and 80% is a, a benchmark of having a system that's in pretty good shape, that the COLA benefit would incrementally increase over time to be more on par with the benefit provided to state employees. So slide 14 sums up the, the employer commitments where uh, you take the other half of that 150 million that's currently in reserve, add another $50 million from FY22 to get you up to $125 million total. That results in just approximately 12.2 million of ADAC savings that begin in FY24. And those savings recur in the future. Same type of plus payment construct is envisioned where um, up to $15 million payment um, would take effect until the system gets to 90% funded. And that general fund construct is revisited. So that 50% is split equally between the two pension systems. Slide 15 just shows the OPEB 
it, it looks a little different here than for the state uh, system. Um, the proposal here is to, again, enact that pre-funding schedule into statute using an ADAC like we do with the pensions where the normal cost and, and the unfunded liability are, are sort of separately calculated and funded every year. But um, inserting the normal cost payment into the ED fund uh, to mirror the, the system you currently have in place with the pensions. Um, and that would, that would begin in FY23 at 15.1 million and increase with payroll from there. But to begin pre-funding, um, the proposal calls for taking 13.3 of the 14 million you all had reserved in the ED fund last year as part of the budget process, move that 13.3 over to start the pre-funding. You wanna start with a little slug of money to hedge against short-term volatility in the investment markets or in your claims experience. So the 52.4 that moved over from the surplus into the state OPEB last year more than satisfies this requirement, but you need a little bit more um, into, the, into the teacher OPEB to begin. And 13.3 aligns with the number that the treasurer um, requested last year. And again, the part of this commitment, it would also be to continue applying the current PAYGO amount out of the general fund. So um, all in all, slide 16 wraps up the total impacts for uh, the, the teacher system. Again, on the right, you see the unfunded liability impact just shy of a billion here, where again, the lion's share of the benefit comes from pre-funding that OPEB. And these preliminary numbers show you um, with, with some minor fluctuations that could uh, happen due to further actuarial analysis that it, some of that higher ed fund cost from pre-funding the OPEB is offset from higher pension contributions from employees and those COLA changes. So things don't perfectly offset, but you get to a point where you're looking at a net new impact to the ed fund of pretty low million dollar numbers. Slide 17 is just a summary slide that again, are, shows very preliminary estimates that I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on today, but just to show you the magnitude of how much all the levers move the different funds. Um, we put this chart together and there's gonna be some, some modest changes due to timing and things like that once the actuaries have a chance to cost things out. And again, you know, you'll have a plan experience from year to year that will make these numbers fluctuate as well. But that's sort of the high level overview so you have a sense of, of what the moving pieces are and, and how much each of those pieces is likely to sort of move the needle in all the different directions. But as Senator Kitchell uh, mentioned earlier, this really th this proposal really does hinge on um, making making some some changes that will reduce the savings on reduce expenses and yield savings on the pension, and then reinvest those savings and that fiscal capacity to further shoring up and paying down our other long-term retirement liabilities. So with that, I'm happy to answer any other questions you may have. Um, it's pretty dense for the first go through. Um, so, uh, and it's hard for me because as I said at Christmas time, instead of sugar plums in my head, I had OPEB and ADAC dancing around. Um, but, um, um, it seems like um, we have come up to a good agreement. I, I think that it is an agreement, so it's more understanding what's in it um, and um, the different pieces of the money. Um, other questions um, in terms of, um, you know, wh what's in the proposal, but I guess the main thing is increased cost sharing, um, an, dealing with our underfunding and for the first time ever get pre-funding um, the cost of that future healthcare benefit for currently employed teachers and state employees, which has not been done. I was surprised it had not been done for state employees either. Um, so um, that this seemed to be, if there's ever a time to deal with this and put in one time money and come to some kind of agreement to shore this up and stabilize it. It seemed like now is the time. The governor's budget did not include anything related to this. It's fully funding the normal um, um, ADEC. So um, <clears throat> the um, parameters around um, 
you know, in the future, the, the plus and how that gets funded <clears throat> will all be put into a language that would go in the green book. So it's clear that it would, those savings would be redirected to fund the plus. And the one thing that we have to find um, is the uh, additional 50 million one-time payment um, to go toward the teachers underfunding. And I don't know, um, 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 Chris sent me a great article and I hope we can get it out because there's lots of concern about a defined benefit plan def versus a defined contribution. And it really does talk about um, both the economic security as well as the fiscal advantage of a DP plan. And I just wanna remind um, committee that in fact, we do have another plan, a retirement plan, which is I believe 100% funded and that's the municipal employees. So um, you can have, um, you can have these plans, they can work, but it's really important that you are um, are more on the conservative side relative to the various assumptions that go in in the calculation um, of the ADEC. But um, uh, for example, and I'll restate it again, for state employees, the pension liability is 1.06 billion, but the healthcare benefit is 1.66 billion. So it is a huge, huge difference in terms of underfunding. On the other hand, the teacher's pension underfunding is 1.9 billion versus the 1.06 for state employees. And part of that was um, the fact that we paid the healthcare, the pay-go healthcare costs out of the corpus of the retirement fund. So we exacerbated the underfunding and you can see that and the differences, I mean, it's almost double what um, the teacher's underfunding. So some of that has what had to do with the assumptions in terms of the calculation, but some of it was attributable to the fact that we used the retirement fund to pay, which we did not do for state employees. So that's, that was also a contributor. Um, so with that, other questions, Stephanie, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, a oh, lot of the pictures and the colors and whatever. <laughs> no, but in addition to the 50 million, you may have to find a little bit of general fund in 23 because I, as I read the, the, the book, uh, the governor's budget book, he did, it seems like he did scoop out that 5.5 on the teacher's pay go side. Um, oh. And there's also a little bit of pressure on the state employee side on the first year of pre-funding that um, mm -hmm. maybe other funds can't pick up. So we might have to think about that a little bit. Okay, I can't believe how they did that. I I, I asked if it could be that the- I think, um, they, think they, 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 think, they think they didn't because of the way the federal grant piece works. But um, when you read the book, it's showing them that they're dropping down to 29.6 on the general fund side, so. Um, and committee that um, what's being referenced here is the treasurer uh, renegotiated the health care plan for uh, retired teachers, and it's a Medicare Advantage um, uh, plan, and that uh, reduced the pay-go costs um, as well um, by $5 million. And we had hoped that, that that would have stayed within, you know, this fence or corral of money um, currently um, um, being um allocated to uh, retirement benefits, but I guess um, the 5 million that I asked the administration if it could be retained, um, apparently got scooped. Okay, uh, any other comments, Stephanie? I wonder if it would be possible to have hard copies of these documents. Um, you know, it's, I think once the bill comes forward, we're going to start to hear from pensioners to either support it or not support it. I, I, I haven't heard much, so I guess that's a good sign. But it'd be helpful to have the documents and hard copies. Yeah, um, they'd be on our website, but I, do you want them put in the mail? Uh, I, I'm, yeah, I, I'm, you know, I'm using ink like crazy um, mm -hmm. right now, and these are all pretty dense documents so it would be easier to get 
by mail. Okay. Okay. And some of the other documents that Chris and Stephanie were just talking about. Okay, we can, um, Chrissy, that might be something that Chrissy could put together and uh, put in the mail for people. Um, yeah, even so the governor's got... 23 budget would be helpful, by the way. Oh. Yeah, anything you guys would like me to send, I'm happy to. So if you just send me a note at what you're looking for, I'll pop them in the mail. Well, I'd be looking oh. for the 23 budget as well as the pension. Oh, okay. Booklets with that in it, with the budget, those regular. Yeah, I know, but we don't. I, I know, I'd like to, we should get them. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I think that's what's being asked it, um, asked for is that budget that we would normally get when we walk out of the chamber. Um, and, and then the slide deck that Chris um, um, and the fiscal summary that um, Stephanie and Chris put together. And yep. anything else, uh, Senator Westman, you had your hand up, other uh, it, documents? Um, I haven't been through everything and it may be in there, but it, what would be helpful for me is before we um, do these proposed changes, um, we roughly went through all of, here's the, um, the deficit in the um, pension systems. After we do these changes, we take care of how much of it and what's left. You know, I think that's probably, uh, Stephanie, that would be the graph I asked you to put together because then it showed, because we were concerned, both groups would say, well, did you get more than I got, for example? And, and, um, <laughs> And um, and they both came in very close at about 150 million between uh, the one-time payments and the ongoing uh, benefits. So uh, that was maybe that we short side-by-side -side chart on yeah, the physical it, pieces of yeah. each, each system. Yeah, this, that, yeah. That, that would be that would be very helpful because what I generally run in my mind is that. The state employees had about a billion dollar hole. The um, state, uh, the teachers had about a two billion dollar hole. Mm -hmm. and I'm not yeah. sure where that um, ties into um, the um, health care in the prepayment of that. So I, I need to have a yeah. way to say to people, it was this. If we do this, it's this. Yes, um, I think That's that uh, side by side thing. chart does exactly that, and it shows what funding stream. Um, is being used because for teachers, obviously, there's some ed fund um, payments here, and it will also that, show the reduced liability. I think that chart's just a couple weeks old. I think we just need to add the estimated liability impact from the COLA pieces, which was I don't think okay. on that chart a couple weeks ago. The, no, the it wasn't. This was yeah. this was just a way of showing yeah. both groups that that we'll our it. response was pretty equitable. Um, yeah. across um, both systems. Although um, obviously the, the pension liability for teachers was much greater as, as Senator Westman said, it was just about double. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, are, excuse me, so are the teachers and state employees, have they been presented this information and are they aware of it? I mean, they have a hearing, mm -hmm. there's a hearing, public hearing tonight at mm -hmm. what is it, 530 for, by Jeanette's committee? Yes, that's, they that's they are aware of it, and as Chris said, these um, yeah. agreements were actually proposed by the two unions. Right, but um, did the information get out there to all the people? Yes, that yes. The the teachers actually had an advisory group of while well, there were three on the task force, they had an advisory group of about twenty. Mm -hmm. So, and they've been feeding information back out to their membership right along, and the same is true with the state employees. So. Um, they 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 had the membership on the task force, and then they had um, um, ongoing communications back out. Now, unlike, these are not the same as um, the contract. I mean, they aren't going to vote on them, but um, uh, but they they are um, what got negotiated here. And the um, one thing that I think. Um, uh, was important was that the members of the task force testified before GovOps in the Senate, um, talking about the process and how um, how that that um, I believe they viewed it as very positive. It was constructive. It was respectful, and um, that what they what we had here was an agreement that they supported and um, would um, you know would um, be very pleased if it can get implemented. So. Uh, th that was the feedback I got, Chris. You were in there, um, but I think that was their testimony. 
No, I think that's right, Senator Kitchell. And and I think you mentioned this, but both um, the, the employee groups that were on the task force and the leaders of the, the employee unions are, they, they have mentioned that they're doing a lot of member education and outreach. So um, these are very, very large systems with tens of thousands of members. I don't expect there will be a unanimous opinion on, on the recommendations, but there was a unanimous opinion at the task force level. And, and these, were, these were recommendations that were put forth by the employee groups. So um, they, are, they are doing a lot of intensive member engagement. I know that. <clears throat> and like well, anything, think... there's not gonna be 100% agreement. As you know, there were some members who felt nothing should happen, no in changes to contributions, the state should simply pay in more money. So um, uh, obviously this is not, <laughs> Um, this doesn't say it's all on the state side. It was it was negotiated. So um, uh, I think there have been some communications back of people that may not like this, for example, um, because they didn't want any any changes other than the state to pay more money. Um, and so I I think actually maybe the uh, head of VSEA might have testified to that effect as well, that mm. out of the large thousands and thousands so far, the feedback has, um, mm. you know, Good. has been uh, well received. Good. Any other uh, questions um, of, of Chris or Stephanie? No, so, very um, good. Very logical and well done. Yes. Him and I could understand it. All, all credit goes to the chair of this committee. <laughs> uh, I, I think Senator, Senator Kitchell got this agreement over the finish line, and, and you know, I, I can't give her enough credit and or to Treasurer Pierce. Um, working with her and her team that has been seamless. Um, they, they are they're a pleasure to work with, and they really care about doing the right thing. So um, this this process just ended in a in a in a good place. I think that's great. Good to hear. Good to hear. So um, any other material, um, we'll do the updated side-by-side, -side, Stephanie, because I have the earlier version of um, that I asked you to put together. And yeah, then we can, um, we can just do that little update and send it around. Yeah. But, Maybe we should get an autographed copy by Jane and the treasurer. Right. <laughs> <laughs> for our, you know, for our walls. And, yeah. Um, the historic. You know, look. Given where we were a year ago in the House Government Operations Committee, and given where you are today, I mean, it's like night and day. Yeah. Um, so kudos. Well, to and if you we had to have that two hundred million, that would have probably still been well, kind of dark. I, it may have been, but I just it, it is what it is. But it's like night oh. and day, the response. So I well, think. Yeah. Given using I, that I, money very, uh, very wisely. Yes, Senator Russman. I probably shouldn't say this, but given where the House's position was on um, um, prefunding some of the OPEB um, in the budget last year, um, um, this is amazing. Well, you were there part of the all the negotiations yeah. and we stated our case, didn't we? Um, we stated our case, and they were, and and at that point, they weren't willing to move at all. Well, um, you know, I'll give them credit; they didn't really understand. I don't think they did, uh, and dif to differentiate between the normal and right. the past, and um, I, you know, and there's always that sensitivity of anything with the Ed Fund, as you know. Um, but I think, in the end, understanding it, there was acknowledgement that this was an obligation that we had to address and that this was good policy. And I do think everybody was in a different place this time. And there was, people were at the table, there was agreement. We had, you know, um, the task force members from both the House and the Senate. And then Representative Ansel was really a very key player as it related to anything to do with the Ed Fund. So I think we, um, we came into it in a very different place. And we recognized that we had to come to an agreement that both uh, the House and the Senate could, could support and uh, that we would not begin to replicate what happened last year um, with that whole 
um, effort that started in the house. So uh, sometimes it, that was pretty painful. And I know some of the task force meetings were pretty painful. Um, I didn't, I, I got spared those, but. Um, I, will, but I will just say, I give them a lot of credit for coming along. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely, it was, it was a, a key part of this whole um, package. There's no question about it. And I think the teachers um, appreciated it. And I, one of the things that um, <laughs> came out was the value and the importance of the healthcare benefit um, as part of that retiree economic security. And so we, we tended to think about just the pension itself, but um, this really is recognizing that that security is really driven by healthcare um, uh, coverage and healthcare benefits. So yes, we ended up, I think, um, working very closely together with the house and um, and then at the end from December on, then I was not part of the task force, but I was uh, obviously involved in all the discussions that went on um, as we were trying to figure out from a fiscal perspective, how we could take um, what uh, was being requested. And, and it really was very positive in the sense, we wanna have an obligation that, you know, there's a commitment to continue to make progress on underfunding. and. Um, and we were able to make that work in a way that could be accommodated by the by the budget, in spite of that five million that we're we'll just have to rescoop it, Stephanie. Count You'll it on have you. find it again to, to just make it the, the full yeah. prefunding work. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, you also have yeah. to reconcile the fifty million that's coming in the budget adjustment with what the governor just put on the table as well. So. Um. And I, I guess you can tell from this conversation that in fact, this whole agreement and negotiation and so forth was done totally by the legislative branch. Um, and so uh, um, that's why there isn't an accommodation. It's not because a request was not made to consider it. Um, it's, it's just, um, how the um, executive branch has wanted to put their budget together. So um, our view is this is, and then if just to go back in the governor's budget to get some of this debt indebtedness paid down, how it's good fiscal policy and how it'll improve, um, you know, um, our bond rating in April. Well, I would submit that, I don't know, remember how much was to pay down maybe 30 million or something, but if we, this 200 million will, um, if we can reduce the liability by 2 billion, I'm, I'm, my instincts are that Wall Street would pay some attention to that. So you've got 30 million, I'll raise it to 2 billion and let it go. How's that? Sounds good. And in the meantime, we've got to find a little money here. We've got to find the one time of 50 million, which the House, I think, uh, um, Representative Hooper was very well aware of what was in this proposal. And um, so I think, you know, she's anticipated it and then we'll can figure out the other 5 million. As she has along. a few state employees in her district. Yeah. And a few teachers. And a few teachers. Yeah. Mainly state so, uh, so yes, Rich. So you mentioned you mentioned timing before and when um, to do this and everything. Um, and um, do they have a preference in the house? Because well, if the, it's done in the twenty three budget and uh, on um, and and there was language that says effective on passage, it still accomplishes by the end of this year, and it gives them a chance to weigh in. Well, the, um, the, there's going to be a separate bill. Jeanette's committee is going to be voting okay. it out, and then it'll go over to the House. Um, and, and as of now, both the House Appropriations Committee and Ways and Means, I believe, that's my understanding, Chris, that you have actually briefed them on uh, these agreements. So that's they're right. they're very well um, in, you know, informed about um, <laughs> the result here. 
but I thought it was important as well um, that uh, this committee, because it's certainly an area of priority for us and, um, um, and um, could move us forward and get it um, to the finish line. Uh, if there's no, if there are no further questions, uh, I realize it's 325. It's been a long day. Um, and I'm going to suggest then we adjourn for today um, on a high note here. And, um, and then we'll reconvene tomorrow. So I'm going to adjourn. The